Good morning. My name is Milton Oaken. I am a record producer, music publisher, arranger, mostly retired at the moment. I'm living in Beverly Hills, California. I started my career as a uh, music teacher in New York City, as a junior high school music teacher. And at um, one summer I was hired as a pianist to travel with Harry Belafonte for his group. And on returning to New York, after a couple of weeks of teaching, I got a full-time offer from him if I would leave the school system and come to work for him, which I did very happily. I started out as his pianist in the band, and I became assistant conductor, arranger, and then finally his conductor. I traveled with him and worked with him for about five years until I was fired. It was very lucky for me that he fired me because I went on to become very successful and earn lots of money in my own name. Whereas if I weren't fired, I would have done the same for him, bringing in artists for recording and for writers for publishing. So the best thing that ever happened to me was uh, his firing me. I was arranging and producing records, and I specialized in the folk music scene when it happened. And my major artists were Chad Mitchell Trio, The Brothers Four, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and out of the Chad Mitchell Trio, eventually John Denver, when the folk scene collapsed, I recorded individuals from the groups. The only one who was successful was John. So I worked with him for the rest of his career. And the last artist I worked for as a record producer was the opera singer Placido Domingo. Since, I'm a, since I was a child, I loved opera. And popular music where I made my living was, was work. But my heart was in classical music and opera. And I met him one night, was uh, at a Grammy dinner. The Grammys were then televised from Los Angeles and we were in New York and RCA invited me to the dinner. And I was up for um, arranging and producing a record called The Belafonte Singers Sing Something or Other. And at the table was Mr. Domingo, who was quite young at the time. And he was up for an album that I knew of, Duets with Leontine Price, one of the most beautiful albums ever made. All these years later, I still listen to it several times a year. My record never sold 10 copies, was never on the radio, was a total stiff. And yet we won the Grammy for Best Folk Recording of the Year. And his masterpiece didn't win. That got me to thinking, and um, eventually I heard him um, sing, and he was truly the best singer I'd ever heard. And uh, at the time, I was doing very, very well as a producer. Denver had, at one point, three albums in the top five in the country, and I thought I was pretty big. And I thought I could make a classical hit out of Domingo. So I tried to reach him, and I tra trailed him, tailed him for five years. And I'd go to London when my kids were in school, and then I'd go there when he was at Covent Garden. I'd go to San Francisco when he was there, go to the Met, and try to meet with him, tell him my ideas for a record. And he kept putting me off. I think he thought I was some kind of overage groupie. And, um, but finally, at my wife's suggestion, I wrote him a letter, gave him my credits, and told him my ideas for an album. And he called me, and we started recording. And uh, he still is, I think, probably the greatest singer of his century. I made a record called Perhaps Love. It's just 21 years ago now. Um, and on it, I put a duet with John Denver. John Denver and Domingo singing Perhaps Love. And it became an immediate hit. Really? And 
the Domingo album went on, it's now sold over seven million. Um, there was never a single release of the song which helped Domingo's album. It was on Columbia Masterworks. John was an RCA, and while I got permission for John to sing with Domingo on an album, couldn't get permission for a single, which led to my divorce from RCA, because at that point, John really needed a hit. He hadn't had one for five years. And the minute this duet went out, it was being played all over the country, like a major pop hit. And it charted on Billboard, first week at 17. Just radio play, no sales. And then Billboard discovered that it wasn't a single, and they said, you have to have the single put out, or else we have to unchart you. Couldn't get RCA to agree to allow it. And uh, it was very sad because John, who really could have benefited from it, didn't. Domingo did, and he went on to you know, make millions. And uh, he turned from an opera singer who was idolized in the opera world and totally unknown outside it to a public figure, which enabled him to do all kinds of things and have major record sales all over the world. And ironically, I had just been fired from John's producing by RCA. Our records were going like that. And you do blame the producer, yeah. you know. And it would have bothered me, but I had just finally succeeded in getting Domingo to do an album, so I felt no pain at all. And uh, the album I turned in with John that was not accepted had one great song on it, a song perhaps love, a love song. Mm -hmm. And. R.C. decided to have John work with another producer, and they hired Larry Butler, who was a very well-known Nashville guy. John was very unhappy, even though I sort of took the fall for the failure. He was really co-producer. As time went on, he got more and more involved in the production. So he took it as a criticism of him, which it, which it was but they couldn't get rid of him, so. Uh, so he was recording with Larry Butler in Nashville the same week that I was doing uh, Domingo's album in New York. And about two weeks before the recordings, John calls me and he said, Larry doesn't want to do any of my songs on the record, which puzzled me because John had only had hits with his own songs. Every album of his had half his songs and half of others, but he never had a hit except for his own songs. So I said, John, you need a hit, and RCA thinks Larry can give it to you, so go along with it. And if you're not happy with the result, you can just say, no, don't put it out. It's totally with your approval. And I said, and he's, he's obviously going to record perhaps Love. That smelled like a hit. He said, no, he doesn't even want to do that. I called him back a couple of hours later. I said, you're sure Larry doesn't want to do perhaps love? He said, yeah. Well, let me show it to Placido. He said, oh, that would be great. I'd love him to do it. Went over to Placido's apartment and played him the record that we had originally turned in the year before. And he had listened to a lot of John's records in picking. He did Annie's song, Follow Me. So he said, I never heard this song in any of his records. I said, no, it's not been released. He said, well, why is John letting someone else release it instead of himself? I said, it's a long story. Do you want to do it? He said, absolutely. And that night I went back to my apartment and said, ooh, wouldn't that be a nice duet? Trading lines. And we did it that way and became a hit and turned Domingo into a worldwide mainstream artist rather than just an opera artist. I see uh, two kinds of music producers, those who are basically technically oriented and those musically oriented. And I think either one can be successful. 
there have been major hit makers who concentrate on the technique and the technology and others who are concentrating on the music. I was a musician, so I had to depend on my engineers and mixers and mastering engineers. So uh, my, I believe that a better producer is a music man rather than technical, but you couldn't prove it. The main thing is helping the artist pick the repertoire, pick the songs, and pick the uh, musicians. And John Denver was really a very special artist. He brought in musicians that I would never have brought in, who were not studio people, but people he met on the road, folk artists. And I think each of them brought a color to the record that would not have been there if, if I had produced it alone. So John was really a very, very um, musically oriented person. So a musical producer and uh, you can tell the guitarists when they're flat, which you can, I had a classical background so I could help John. He came in one night with a song, a new song he'd written, played it for me on the piano and it was very beautiful. I said, John, the only problem is that it's the exact melody of Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony, Second Movement. And it was already a hit some years back. I forget the name of it. And I played him the Tchaikovsky melody, which was his first six, first eight measures. He went over to the piano in the corner, came back, and I changed it. So now only the first phrase was the same. And it got to be his biggest song, any song. Da 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 da, which is the second movement of the Fifth Symphony. <laughs> so, a technology-oriented producer would have let the his original song go through, and he would have been sort of ridiculed. I think. As a matter of fact, I think the secret of my success has been only finding great artists. I know a lot of producers, a lot of friends think that they're they're the ones who make the great music. And I think spending more time finding someone who's really good uh, pays. So what makes them great, it's so ephemeral, it's hard to say. And you get them in all fields. I think Pete Seeger is great. I think John Denver was great. I once asked Placido, uh, sort of in a way, what makes him great. Music is really your passion. He said, no, 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 no. My passion is for my children, for my wife, for soccer. Music is my life. It's not his passion, it's his life. <laughs> and uh, that answers it. there's a beautiful story about John Denver. Sad, but beautiful. The last concert I heard him do was here in California, at Thousand Oaks. And uh, I drove out to hear him. And I said, after, on the way back to his hotel, I said, John, I really have never heard you more, sing more beautifully and more tellingly. That audience was absolutely entranced. And, and he said, you know, I think I owe it partially to Mr. Domingo. I said, how is that? He said, when we first recorded Perhaps Love, and it was such a success, you once pointed out to me, listen to the way Placido colors his words. He, when he sings, love is like steel, the voice is like steel. When it's like a cloud, it's like a cloud. And you hear him sing, and he, he makes the words echo the music. Then I listen to his opera recordings, and even though I don't understand them, I know what he's saying by the emotion he imparts. So I go back home and I spend, you know, a couple of hours a week going through my old songs, seeing what I can do with my voice and my guitar to really point out what the emotion is. Let the music make the emotion more real. 
And, you know, I, I finally did tell Domingo the story just a few, few months ago, because I could never tell without, never think about it without crying. Cause, but uh, Domingo is a great artist, and he's, uh, he's totally supportive of people around him. You know, just, as was John. I certainly think John, John's writing will uh, last for a long time. Hearing a great song is um, its own definition. You hear it and you know it. I can't say that's good lyric and quite good melody. It's, it just uh, expresses a feeling that is inescapable. That's what makes a song, I think. In essence, the lyric is more important than the music. Can't be really great if it doesn't have great music, but I think without a very, very strong lyric, you won't have a great song. Could have a hit song, have a pop song, but I don't think you can have a great song. Mm -hmm. Through my publishing company, I've put out a series of books through the years called the Great Song Series. Great songs of the first one was Great Songs of the '60s, mm -hmm. then Great Songs of each of the other eras. And picking the songs was very interesting. You know, and I really had to come to grips with why is this worth entering, including, and why is this one not? Where have all the flowers gone? Recorded with, was recorded first by Pete Seeger, written by him, and recorded with Peter, Paul, and Mary. It's an ingenious lyric, and it's a very powerful lyric. Um, a song, Last Thing on My Mind by Tom Paxton. I think that's a great song. And it expresses, you know, how he feels about, about his woman. Um, one of John's songs, um, Rhymes and Reasons, it was never a hit but it has one of the most beautiful lyrics I've ever heard. The children and the flowers are my sisters and my brothers. Their laughter and their loveliness would clear a cloudy day. That's a great song. One night in France, my wife and I spent our summers in France. I was listening to the, the radio was on while I was half sleeping and they played Rhymes and Reasons by John, who was very popular in France. And they said, um, John Denver really represents the best part of America, just like Henry Purcell represents the best in England. But he said first, just like Henry Purcell represents the best characteristics of being English, John Denver represents the best feelings of being an American. That really woke me up. <laughs> Just, That's deep. And he was very pleased when I, when I told him that story. I would say the greatest conductor uh, is Valery Gergiev, the Russian liqueur of opera. I think he's probably the best conductor I've ever heard. He's the, the leading guest conductor at the Met. He does two months a year at the Met. And there were newspaper articles about a year and a half ago that some of the musicians didn't like him, didn't like his style. Or... And then there was a review. He did a concert at Carnegie Hall with the Kirov Orchestra from Russia. And the reviewer said, the Metropolitan should have bought 100 tickets, sent their orchestra there to see what Gergiev was trying to get out of them. First thing I ever saw him do was Parsifal in Salzburg, which I had always found a pretty boring opera. He made it dyna dynamic, just dynamic. Had a fantastic cast, but still he just, and a great orchestra of the Vienna Philharmonic. And then whenever I can go here, I, I go, and he did a concert out here, and. It was just three days after I had seen Lohengrin at the Met. 
And his first encore here was the third act prelude to Lohengrin. And I had just seen Levine do it at the Met. Great orchestra, great conductor. And this thing sort of blew the roof off. It was so good. <laughs> I said, this guy's incomparable. And uh, every time I've seen him, just. And he comes from a little village in the Caucasus. Uh, and Placero Domingo runs an opera contest every year that he calls Aparelia. Gets 40 young between uh, singers up to the age 30, I think is the limit, come and get into a contest. And he picks what they pick. He has judges who are normally the directors of different opera houses around the world who see these young singers. And 40 singers and five accompanists. So each one handled eight singers. The first two rounds they did with piano, then the semifinals and the finals with orchestra. One of the pianists, and all five were wonderful pianists, since I had worked for a while as an accompanist, I recognized good accompanying, and then one of them was a kind of buxom Russian lady who was Valerie Gergiev's sister. And she proceeded to blow the house apart. And she was the best accompanist I had ever heard. And I was thinking, two people from a little village in the Caucasus are geniuses. Los Angeles Opera is doing a program, a project for the schools called Voices for Tolerance. And for each of three segments of the population, one is for the African-American, one is for Hispanic kids, and the third is about the concentration camp in Germany at the, during the Holocaust, the Terezin concentration camp, which had a lot of music involved in it. So um, our education committee, which luckily Domingo supports as, as strongly as he does what goes on the main stage. So we had a, um, a major work for each of the two for the for the African-American, we're bringing out the Alvin Ailey dance troupe to do chain gang dances. They have a whole program of it. For the Terracin concentration camp segment, we're doing the Verdi Requiem, which was done at a German concentration camp in Prague. And the third thing we're doing didn't have a work for the main stage, the Hispanic. And then a composer who's wonderful, movie and opera composer, Lee Holdridge. Do you know the name at all? No, no. Very good composer. He's Hispanic. He's from Costa Rica. And I told him about the problem. We're, we don't have a work for the Chandler main stage for the big audience. Mm -hmm. And he said, 10 years ago, I did a film called Old Gringo with Jimmy Smith's um, Jane Fonda couple of others, and it was about Pancho Villa, the Mexican revolutionary. And Lee wrote the score. And he said there was a piece in there, Pancho Villa was a real music lover, and wherever he went, get the local band, whatever, to play for him in the evening. Little village in Mexico. There was a family, a family band, a man named Mendez, had his children, nine children, a band. And the star of the band was his nine-year-old son, Raphael, played trumpet. You know the name? Scary. I grew up listening to his records. Okay, so Lee wanted to put Raphael as a boy. They, they had, it was in the film, uh, and Lee was doing the music, so he hired the best trumpeter in town. And the pr producer said, hey, it's a nine-year-old kid. You don't get a great trumpeter to play. But the trumpeter he hired said, that kid grew up to be the greatest trumpeter who ever lived. So, <laughs> yeah. so Lee came up with the idea of doing a concerto para Rafael. And it tells the story of him being kidnapped by Pancho Villa, working with him for a couple of years. Then leaving for the United States as a boy of 13 or 14, working in a um, automobile plant in Flint, Michigan. One day, he was standing in front of a music store in Flint, 
looking up at a very beautiful silver trumpet, and a man sees him. What are you looking at, kid? He said, oh, that beautiful silver trumpet. Do you play? Uh, yeah, come on in, play it for me. And he goes in, and the man happened to be a band leader, Russ Morgan, who was playing across the street. He either kidnapped him or hired him or bought him or whatever. And Raphael traveled with him for two years. Then he was hired by Rudy Valley, traveled with him for two years. Then he became the first trumpeter of the MGM Studio Orchestra World. MGM was doing all the films, musical films. He got to be so well known that he started doing concerts with all the major symphony orchestras. He'd play a Haydn concerto, Mozart concerto, or a Hummel concerto. And what he did the next day, after every concert, he'd go to the local high school or college and give a clinic to the brass players in the band. And he really f was an educator. Had a third grade education, but. He died in 1986, and Doc Severinsen, the trumpeter, put together a record called Legacy, The Legacy of Rafael Mendez. Uh, it's out of print now, unfortunately. It's a great record. It has some of his playing, and it has six first chair trumpeters, Boston Symphony, Cleveland, Los Angeles Philharmonic, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia Orchestra. And they each told about Raphael, what Rafael meant to them. And, it's, and they talk, and it's speaking, they talk. And each one of the six had a different reading. One talked about his tone quality, one about his virtuosity, one about his breath control, one about his educational. And they all felt that they became great trumpeters based on Raphael. So Lee is writing a piece called Concerto para Raphael. We're going to have two versions of it, one for symphony orchestra, trumpeter, narrator, three opera singers, um, and that'll play in the Chandler. We're doing four performances. And Domingo is going to play Pancho Villa and Raphael's father. Another tenor is going to, uh, baritone Rod Guilfrey is going to do uh, Russ Morgan, Rudy Valley, and the contractor of the MGM Symphony, and a mezzos. Susanna Guzman is going to play his wife. And ironically, Raphael had two sons who were also great trumpeters, twins, but they became doctors. They didn't want to, they couldn't have followed their father, you know. And they have an office three blocks away from the Los Angeles Music Center as their urologists now in their 60s. And they worked with Doc Severinsen on putting together this legacy record. So we spoke to them about we're dedicating this whole project to the memory of Rafael Mendez. And uh, a second version will be just for five or six pieces, three singers, narrator, to go around to the schools. We, have, we do operas written especially for children all around the uh, Southern California. So, um, that's going to be very exciting. And for this town, for this Southern California, where 65% of the children are Hispanic, can you imagine the inspiration that uh, the life of Mendez will be for them? That's great. Just, uh, and I got a great idea. It's going to be in three movements. The first movement is Pancho Villa. Second movement is America, Morgan Valley, MGM. And the third is more about his children and his wife and whatever. It'll, altogether, it'll be about 45, 50 minutes, playing a lot of the things he, he made famous and some original stuff, together with working in with the singers, you know. About five minutes from the end, you hear a trumpet off stage. And it gradually gets closer and closer, and it sort of does a duet with the main guy on stage. And in will walk a 10-year-old boy or girl who's a virtuoso. Dramatic moment. Then, just before the end, he wrote one march which came, became very famous, the Diamond. Doors of the Chandler Pavilion open and in will walk the USC marching band brass section on stage together with the symphony, the singers, 
the trumpeters be fantastic. You know, so that's an educational project that really will make a difference in this town. I've seen so many people have successful emotional and financial lives by going to music. And I've seen so many people who have been unhappy because they didn't take a chance and do it. If your child has ability and the drive, I think it's worth taking the risk. The upside is enormous. It used to be that you want your child to do something where he can make a living. Now you can make a living if you're a qualified musician or a singer. And you can also get very rich. So I think that parents, if their children have the fire and the desire, give them a shot. There's a wonderful story of a young girl. And her name is Danielle Denise. Was born in Sri Lanka. At six, she moved to Australia with her parents. And she immediately became a, uh, a performer, would do commercials and dance and sing on television as a child. She was very, very attractive and very good, evidently, at what she did. And her parents decided to take a shot and they moved to the United States, moved here to Los Angeles. And she was working as a, uh, doing commercials and not sure what else. Then 10 years ago, or nine years ago, we were auditioning people for a new children's opera called Journey to Cordoba. Had a part for a 15 year old girl, the main part. And Danielle came in and auditioned and won the part. She was extraordinary. She graduated high school here two years later at 17 or 18, went to New York to study opera, was taken up by the Metropolitan Student Program or Young Singers. Within a year, she was doing roles at the Met. Probably one of the singers, youngest singers ever at 18 or 19. Or maybe it was a little older than that. She's now 24. And she's getting reviews around the world that are just mind-blowing. And it's an example of parents seeing someone with talent and going with it. And the parents are as fulfilled as she is. They really are. It's a marvelous family story, you know, and, uh, and pay attention to the name, Danielle Denise.